Now, if I offend you with this, good, because honestly, it's the truth. We're in a spiritual war in our country. As a nation, we are struggling to be able to articulate what it means to be an American. We care much more about what you can change versus what you can't change. You know what the division in America really is? Between people who complain and people who produce. It's that simple. The message should be, I don't want to hear your complaining. Work harder, wake up earlier, stop doing drugs, stop drinking save money you will never be the best version of yourself if you allow other people to convince you that you can't be better because of your skin color because of your sexual identity because of the community you came from you must resist those narratives at all costs if you truly want to be successful in america an entrepreneur is a problem solver it's that simple who here wants to be rich i want to be rich i want to be successful great find a problem and solve it and you'll get rich What's the one thing the rich, the wealthy, and the successful have in common? It's the attitude that they bring to life. 99% of the world would consider to be an impediment, they look as an opportunity. There are the grateful and the ungrateful. The mark of the happiest and the most joyful people on the planet are people that make the conscious decision and attitude to engage in gratitude. I'm grateful that I get to be an entrepreneur. Everything starts to change. When you look at these things as opportunities, not as obstacles, you will break through them. And it's just as simple as a mindset shift. Okay, you guys ready for this interview? Yeah. We've got a gentleman here named Charlie Kirk. Grew up in Chicago. Anybody here from Illinois? Yeah. He's originally from Chicago, went to Wheeling High School. He left college, I think he spent a semester at Turning Point USA, but anyway, or at Harper College before he started Turning Point USA. And uh, Turning Point USA's mission is to educate students about the importance of fiscal responsibility, free markets, and limited government. TPUSA claims over presence over 1,100, 1,200 college campuses across high schools across the country and labels them as the largest and fast growing youth organization in America. He's authored, of many, he's authored many books, of which I'll be asking him about, called The College Scam. He's a conservative advocate, host of The Charlie Kirk Show, which by the way, he, was just got, he just got done doing a podcast. He just got doing a podcast, he's doing this interview right here. Uh, right after graduating high school, he started his nonprofit, Turning Point USA, with his graduation money of 1,800 bucks, and his donations served, surged from 2016 through the pandemic, over $138 million in donations. So, PHP, could you please rise to your feet and help me welcome to the stage, Mr. Charlie Kirk! Yeah. Charlie, how are you? All right, so we're gonna do this. By the way, Charlie Kirk, I asked him in the back. We do 22 push-ups before we start our BOMs at our office. Charlie Cook would like to join us doing those 22 push-ups. Could you please get into push-up position? Marines, front leaning rest positions. On your faces, let's go. 22 push-ups, let's go. For honoring veteran suicide and their memories in uniform. Ready? I'll cut the cadence, you cut the repetitions. When they say up, you say one. When they say up, you say two. Ready? Exercise. Up. 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 Up, 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 Hug, he's fired up. All right. <laughs> now, now we're breathing, now we got the boil, the boiling blood rolling. So Charlie, uh, very excited to have you here. Our theme this year is saving America. What do you think are our top three, four, five, whatever on the top of your head, biggest enemies killing this dream of America? and killing this experiment called America. Well, first, honor to be here. I, I, I love speaking at PHP. You guys have great energy, <laughs> I gotta tell you. It's great. And um, big fan of Patrick and 
really what he brings to the world. Look, uh, we could get into this if you want. I think we're in a spiritual war in our country, and I think that we need to acknowledge that. But honestly, look, there's a couple things that I really want to focus on. A as a nation right now, we are struggling to be able to articulate what it means to be an American. And so, personally, if you look at what has made America a different country, what has made it the greatest country ever to exist in the history of the world, it's that we, the country I grew up in, and we are losing it, we care much more about what you can change versus what you can't change. For example, I don't care about the color of your skin. I do not care about the color of your skin. I care about your character. I care about your actions. I care about the results. I care about your grit. I care about your hustle. I care about your integrity. I do not care about the color of your skin. And guess what? You shouldn't either. I care about things you can change and things you can improve upon. We're losing that in this country. In instead, people feel as if their identity is either in their skin color or their, you know, their personal sexuality. The country, America's, the promise of America is it does not matter who my parents were. If you go to India, India's a different country than America. You're in a caste system. America is now becoming a recaste society where it, you're supposed to be put in a box based on, let's just say, pre-programmed identity characteristics. And this is disempowering for all people, by the way. And so what, what, is, what is harming you know, the American experiment or the promise of America? We are teaching our young people to participate in what I call the oppression Olympics. It's a competition of who can get the most points because I'm the most oppressed person. Instead, it should be, so what? Work harder, wake up earlier, stop doing drugs, stop drinking, save money, stop gambling the money away. I know you're in Vegas, so it might not be popular, but whatever. <laughs> the message should be, I don't want to hear your complaining. Look, I, I, I talk a lot about the problems of the woke or whatever. Honestly, you know what the division in America really is? Between people who complain and people who produce. It's that simple. That's the true division in America. And look, there, there's some things you could legitimately complain about, but then the question is, what do you do about it? Do you, do you, do you own that and you assume that in your actions and your beliefs, and you know this, sure. or instead do you say, that's actually not a true picture of who I am. I'm gonna become a better version of myself. I'm afraid we're losing that. This is not even political, quite honestly. This is an existential question for the nation. And by the way, for those of you that want to make money and earn, uh, you know, earn a good living and build wealth, I can tell you, you will never be the best version of yourself if you allow other people to convince you that you can't be better because of your skin color, because of your sexual identity, because of the community you came from, you must resist those narratives at all costs if you truly want to be successful in America. It's awesome. I mean, Charlie, I'm, I'm Filipino by DNA and background. I was raised in Chicago. We were raised in, I went to Morton High School in Berwyn Sisters, the area. No kidding. And, uh, and uh, I wasn't raised around a lot of Filipinos. It was an Italian neighborhood. It was a, a Latino neighborhood, African-American neighborhood right there. Anyway, my... Cousins always ask me, how come you're not considered one of the top Filipino American businessmen in the country? I said, I don't care about being a top Filipino. I care about being a top businessman, period. And so, um, but I, I, want to, I want to be a devil's advocate, Charlie. Chicago is one of the most racially segregated big cities in America. We know that. We know, where the, we know who lives on the north side, south side, Burbs, Lake Forest, Palatine, Schaumburg, etc. And they say, Charlie, it's easy for you to say that, Charlie. You got this whole white privilege got going on for you. You know, it's easy for you to say that. What, what, would, you, what would you respond to that? Yeah, so a couple things. Um, I didn't go to New Trier, uh, if you know. Yes, of course. So let me tell you where about the rich where kids I, go. Look, yeah. I, I had a nice upbringing, no doubt. Um, but I'll tell you where I grew up. I went to Wheeling High School, which was a minority, majority high school. So I was a minority as, as a white male. And looking back now, 10 years, the high school has changed a lot. Do you know what was remarkable about my four years in high school? Nobody cared about race. There was no BLM. There was no white privilege walks. You know what we cared about? 
We cared about whether or not you were a good person. We oh. cared about your actions. Yep. We cared about whether or not you wanted to apply yourself to become the best possible version of yourself. Yeah. And so I, I laugh, you know, when people will say, oh, you know, you have white privilege. And I'll say, well, hold on, like, like, let's, let's, are you your own individual, be are you your own individual person? Let's just isolate that. Everybody has problems, whether it be single motherhood, sickness, cancer, those are not isolated to one particular racial group. And let's pretend for a second that white privilege is legit and real, which it isn't, it's, it's not. But let's pretend that it is, okay? Let's pretend that it is. Then what are you gonna do about it? Are you gonna spend the rest of your life being an activist on the side of the road with a sign? Or are you gonna go be the, be the best entrepreneur that you can, create a business, push yourself to new, new levels? That's the question. And what, what I resist at all costs are mass narratives that disempower the potential of the entrepreneur. Why is America the greatest nation ever to exist in the history of the world? One of the other reasons is that if you want to be successful, meritocracy allows you to do that. So a meritocracy allows you and rewards the best possible decisions and you climb up the, climb up the ladder appropriately. And you look at this, I'm sure a lot of you are first generation or second generation Americans. Why are we the envy of the rest of the world? What have we done differently? Well, we've set up our systems in such a way and we're, we're losing it where you yourself can make those good decisions. You could save money, you can delay gratification so that you can then have a better future. You wanna get rich? The secret to getting rich? Charlie, how'd you get successful? You delay feeling immediately good and then one day you can get successful. You wanna know, you know who remains poor? People that spend money on immediate highs. Liquor, alcohol, drugs, other Vegas-centric activities. <laughs> And look, I can get into the, the numbers or the figures into all like, oh, this white privilege thing and all this. If that's going to be your life's calling to just complain about this, you've already lost. You're going to remain permanently government addicted and poor. I guarantee it. However, if you say, okay, there might be some truth, not some truth, I'm happy to get into the numbers. I'm not interested in that right now. Instead, have you done everything you possibly can? And so I, I, I you know, I get lecture, I go to college campuses and mm -hmm. so you don't have to and I hear all these ideas and you know, there's, this, there's these people that are overweight, they haven't shaved in like two months, and their hair is down to their hips, and they're telling me that America's systemically racist and that we're gonna die of climate change and that I need to give my money because I'm part of the 1%. And I'm like, how about you make your bed and get a haircut before you lecture me that I need to give away my hard-earned money? Like, why don't you go and yeah. improve yourself? Yeah. And what I'm getting at is you must break free of the mass media simulation that seeks to control you. You understand they wanna make you permanent consumers, addicted to government programs, addicted to substances. They don't want you to be trim. They don't want you to be healthy. They don't want you to be taking the best supplements or eating the best food. They want you to be androgynous consumers where you are miserable, where you are quite honestly depressed on antidepressants all day long. The best way to break free of that is to say, I am not going to, to consume what the mass media networks are feeding me. I am my own sovereign being made in the image of God, yep. and I'm going to flourish beyond the bad guy's wildest imagination. Move it up. I, I would say this, Charlie. When I initially met you, uh, George Palayo, Unity, had invited me to speak at the regional conference, and you're one of the speakers there in a regional, a smaller conference than this. So I had the first time to interview backstage, meet you. Um, and you just had recently gotten married. I will say it right now, you look more fitter after getting married. And by the way, you guys, I, 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 you weren't even concerned when I said, oh, you want to do the 22 push-ups? Want to do 22? The only thing we worried about was, can I do that in my suit? Yeah, no, that's right. And yes. so the, the, the typical guy today is worried about uh, doing push-ups. So if I'm with you in high school, yeah. and if I read about some of the articles about you in high school, you were constantly challenging liberal teachers in high school. Yep. You're, and and I'm a, I was a goofball in high school. If I was voted to be something in high school, I'd be vo voted stupidest laugh and sense of humor. But you're being voted the crazy kid, yeah. the kid that was out there. So what got you to start thinking that way to challenge your, your teachers? So I, I want to just tell you a little bit more about my story. I, I never went to college. So I've been 11 years as an entrepreneur, all sorts of different nonprofits, businesses, you know, traveled the country, traveled the world. And I just want to encourage you. If you do not have that worthless piece of paper from a local college, 
you could still succeed to great heights in this country. Okay? Now, if you do have that worthless piece of paper from college, it means nothing. It means nothing. It doesn't do anything for me. In fact, it probably might tell me some other things about what I have to deprogram you. I guarantee you some of you right now have friends, family, parents that are saying, oh, why didn't you get that piece of paper? Why didn't you go $100,000 in debt? And you're probably at this event and you probably hear that whisper. You probably hear that, you're like, man, can I still succeed? Because the media, the government, your leaders think you're stupid if you do not have that piece of paper. Do you, let me prove it to you. Do you notice how they do political polling in this country? They do college educated and non-college educated. What are they really telling you? This is what the smart people think and this is what the dumb people think. But who has wisdom? It's a much, it's a much deeper question. The least wise people in American society go to Harvard, Yale, Princeton, and Stanford. They believe men can give birth, literally. <laughs> there is more wisdom in the PHP community, in the plumbing community, in the electrician community, than all the halls of the Ivy League schools. And let me tell you why. Because you're here because you want to be more and you are rejecting this idea of just staying still. I think that's beautiful. Honestly, some of the most entitled people are the people that go to Brown or Dartmouth because they think they have it made. So I didn't go to college. We're, we're partners in that way. And you know what? It's been the best thing for me. Well, I'm already pretty driven. I'm, you know, I work pretty hard and have tra literally, I was tallying it up, traveled 3,100 3, days in the last 11 years. Million Meyer Club in every single airline, you know, visited every 50, all 50 states 10 times over, the whole thing. And But what motivates me sometimes, and I want this to be motivation for you, is when some snob, sanctimonious person comes up to you and they say, oh yeah, you didn't go to college? What do you have to offer? The next time you hear that, you say, I'll show you. Because they're always going to try to keep you down. Here's why. And because you're not in the club. It's almost a secret society where the way you enter the club is a special diploma or a special piece of paper. What would challenge them and empower you is all of a sudden when they realize that there are hundreds of thousands of entrepreneurs that want it more, that can create value in such unbelievable ways because you didn't need to go to those four years in college. But what was I like in high school? Look, I mean, uh, to answer the I mean, it kind of come full circle. Look, I, I, wanted, I wanted to be successful. It was an interesting thing. When I first started at Turning Point USA, I thought desire was an equally distributed, let's just say, characteristic in people. If you simply want it more than your competition, that's a big deal. That alone, you don't need to be even smarter, you don't even have better ideas. Just pure grit, hustle, and desire. That alone can be a huge, a huge defining um, characteristic in that way. And so, look, I, I, wanna, I wanna just, you know, kind of finish the question on this. The, there will be people that try to say no and try to keep you down at every single turn. I've experienced it. But you have a choice, and this is what's so beautiful about acknowledging you're a sovereign being, you're not a cog in the wheel, you're not going to be an androgynous consumer, is that you can use the condemnation, or you didn't go to college, you're not smart, you can use it as an excuse to stay fat and lazy, or as an excuse, as fuel to the fire to say, I'm going to show that person. I could tell you, that is a darn powerful motivational tool to then 11 years later, when I look back at my, my high school classmates that now have $200,000 in debt and they studied North African lesbian poetry at NYU. <laughs> and they're, they're serving triple shot frappuccinos, posting on Facebook on America systemically racist. And I was like, you know what? You have the piece of paper. <laughs> Toilet paper. I'm married, I have a daughter, I love my country, I have purpose, I'm joyful, we have a beautiful organization. But hey, keep your piece of paper, pal.
Yes. Yeah. Hey, give it up. Uh, yesterday, Charlie, I gave a talk on who wants to be a millionaire. And I said, who is raised in the language of brokenese and who is raised in the language of richenese or millionese? And so uh, your, your father, uh, Robert Kirk, was an architect and a investor and entrepreneur in senior uh, living communities, which is awesome because that's the community I've got my, my parents in now. Um, did your dad raise you with this type of language? Did he, did he plant these seeds of how to look at the word, world from an entrepreneur perspective? How, how did your dad raise you in this? Yeah, I, 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 have, I have great parents. In fact, here's how great my parents were. When I said I wasn't going to college, they didn't try to completely disown me from the family, which is, uh, that's a mark, that's a mark of great parents. So look, I, I grew up around entrepreneurs. And so what is an entrepreneur? An entrepreneur is a problem solver. It's that simple. Who here wants to be rich? I want to be rich. I want to be successful. Great. Find a problem and solve it and you'll get rich. It's that simple. Find something people are complaining about. Remember the division of America, complainers and producers, complainers and creators, and then solve the problem. I can't get away, I can't get around Vegas very quickly or cheaply. Okay, how about we have a rideshare service? We'll call it Uber or Lyft. Oh, I, you know, the, the coffee really is awful at the local gas station. Okay, we're going to revolutionize the way we do coffee. Dunkin' Donuts, Starbucks. Find something people are complaining about and then develop a solution and then you're able to get rich. And so what it requires though is it requires an entire mindset shift. And here's my, one of my challenges for you is to start realizing <coughs> the thought patterns that might be holding you hostage or prison that are actually keeping you in a place of control, not in a place of growth. And the best way to isolate this is by journaling. Journaling is great because it's intentionally slow. You cannot write as fast as you think. Therefore, it requires you to be precise in what you're actually thinking. And so if you journal every single day, you're like, wow, I'm really negative about myself. Like I'm over, I'm over focusing on the heaviness and the pessimism. And then all of a sudden you could be like, you know what, I'm going to develop better thought patterns. There's a great book called The Gap and the Gain that really emphasizes this. It's changed my life. It's a great book. But you have a total choice over what type of thought matrices you are going to bring into your own life, which is really beautiful when you think about it. Because the rest of society, of colleges, and the media would actually lead you to believe that you are not able to control the attitude you bring to the rest of your life. Doing this for 11 years, I've had a chance to meet over 200 billionaires, meet you know, people all across the world. What's the one thing the rich, the wealthy, and the successful have in common more than anything else? It's not their intelligence, it's not. It's not even that they all went to college, it's not. It's the attitude that they bring to life. The attitude of self-made entrepreneurs of high levels is an attitude that you present something that 99% of the world would consider to be an impediment, they look as an opportunity. It is the biggest reason that divides the wealth creators versus people that are permanently government addicted. Crazy. Uh, you know, by the way, I'm just, yeah, there you, go, there you go. I was thinking about our CEO, Patrick McDavid, doesn't have a college degree, immigrant. Uh, our income, top income earners of PHP, 90%, 95% don't have a college degree. I don't have a college degree. You don't have a college degree. Success leaves clues. And so when I'm thinking about Turning Point USA, you took your graduation money, and uh, there's, as I was researching, how did you create this organization? Um, there's a gentleman that you, you tracked down. Um, uh, what's his name? Um, Foster Freeze. Fra Fra correct. Can you say his name again? Yeah. Uh, Foster Freeze. Yeah. Foster Freeze. So you're 18, 19 years old. And you hit him up, you're getting ready, and he, he donates $10,000 to your organization. Can you tell me what that preparation is like? Because you don't have a, you're 18, how old were you at that time? 18, 19 years old? Yeah, 18, 19. And, and you were prepared. You were ready to have a conversation with him. So this is what drives me nuts. I, I met a college kid recently. I said, what are you studying? He said, I'm studying entrepreneurship. I said, well, that is a waste of time and money, man. You don't study entrepreneurship, you do entrepreneurship. Come okay? on. <laughs> Here's the thing, I, I, I give advice to entrepreneurs all the time, and just, look, we've been so blessed, okay? We have 350 employees at Turning Point USA. You know, we do over $80 million in revenue. We have 280,000 donors. We're, we're, praise God, beyond my Amen. wildest expectations. So, but 
one of the things I learned about being an entrepreneur is that you can get into a place of paralysis in planning. I have to have the business plan perfect and I have to, no you don't. The only thing you have to be able to answer is why. That's it. You don't need, all the other stuff is easy. You could hire people for that and figure it out. So when I met Foster Freeze in a stairwell, I had no money, no connections, no idea what I was doing. I decided I was gonna take a gap year off college. It ended up being, again, 11 gap years. It's an ongoing, it's a gap decade. I had no idea what I was doing, but I had passion and I had the why. My why was very simple. I love America and we're losing it. I wanna do something about it. That, 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 was, that was my answer. And he was like, well, what are you gonna do? And I threw out all these ideas and they were, half of them were awful. But he sensed the passion because I had the why that was configured correctly. If you understand your why, you can get through any, any what or how, any. And so when you, when you try to go into business as an entrepreneur and you're thinking about all the obstacles or, you know, I have to perfectly plan this, you understand that is a prison mindset. If you, if you bet on yourself in an entrepreneurial scenario, you're going to be adjusting along the way anyway. And you're like, oh, well, this or that, or you're going to be learning in real time. But it requires you to first take that, that first step. And that's what we did at Turning Point USA. And I mean, I didn't know how to do payroll or hire people or fire people or any of it. But you learn along the way. And that's the other thing. Surround yourself with successful people that are ethical. You, you end up being the average of who you spend, the, f the five people you spend the most time with. So another kind of homework assignment for you, write down who you spend time with. The five most people you spend time with, that's who you are. So if you spend time with gossipers, with low energy complainers, if you spend time with people that are always kind of getting a buck for free, that's who you're going to be. But if you spend time around people like Patrick Bet David, people that are high energy, that are ethical, that are pushing boundaries, looking for solutions, that is going to rub off on you. Audit your relationships and purge the people that are weighing you down. You will become better because of it. Crazy. He asked for 10 grand. You guys got to ask people for 199. So let's talk about that. So when you are recruiting people to Turning Point USA, it's a nonprofit. There's not a lot of upside there. We, we, we have a lot of upside here. You could be a millionaire. You could be financially free and not so much in the nonprofit world. So what message are you selling people to come on board to turning people USA? Who's the enemy? How do you retain them? And what's the upside for them to want to stick with you? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, so in the nonprofit world, there's a lot of comfort. There's a lot of just slow moving. We're entrepreneurs. We move super fast. That's why we've gone from zero dollars to $80 million in revenue in 11 years. And we're the largest you know, in the conservative space because we bring kind of this entrepreneurial disruptive mentality to a space that is otherwise honestly boring and comfortable. We're able to attract the best talent, not because I can pay them the best. And this is, if they want to go make more money, go work for Goldman Sachs, right? Go work for Google. But do you know what I tell them? You're never going to have to be asked your pronouns at Turning Point USA. <laughs> You're not gonna have to go through some stupid struggle session and you get to actually wake up every single day and be fulfilled. Your soul will be fed and watered in a way that you would be not even close to at a regular corporate job. At Turning Point USA, we have the best staff in the country that works their tails off because every single day they could say, I am waking up to save America. I am waking up to do the work to help make sure my grandkids can live in a free society. And I gotta be honest, the, the, the upside has just been tremendous. And we're able to recruit great talent. We're able to get people engaged and involved. And we have members of Congress now. You know, many of you know Candace Owens who got her start at Turning Point USA, a great and powerful voice. And so um, if you get the why correctly, then that, that purpose fills the void in a very, very powerful way. Candace Owens just interviewed Andrew Tate. Yep. Our CEO flew to Romania to interview Andrew Tate. His message seems to be suppressed. He just finally got released from uh, home, um, home arrest. Home arrest. What, what, what do you think is keeping the powers that be afraid of that message that Andrew Tate is bringing out to the world? Yeah, I mean, look, 
A Andrew is a very smart man, and I'm not going to get into all the accusations against him. I don't know the truth, or we'll, we'll find out. But I will say this, what he says is so powerful, and let's, let's emphasize on that. What Andrew Tate is doing is he's communicating a warning of what happens when society becomes too feminine. Now, if I offend you with this, good, because honestly, it's the truth, and you need, you need to hear it. So, so, by the way, for the ladies in the audience, I would venture a guess you are underwhelmed by the feminization of American men as it's happening around you. I hear it all the time. So as society can become too feminine, it also can become too masculine, okay? So we know what happens when a society becomes too masculine. You get Mussolini, right? You get too dictatorial, too rigid. That's where you quote unquote get the kind of authoritarianism that we're warned against. But have we ever thought deeply, what happens when a society archetypically becomes too feminine? That's an interesting question, isn't it? Well, all of a sudden you get the complete disregard for rules, customs, and guardrails because you want to accept all things. You get, you get feelings-based societal governance over rationality-based societal governance. It is the man's job in a marriage and a, when you raise a child to say no. That is my job as a father. No, 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 no. In a society, when you do not have people saying no, really bad ideas start to metastasize and infect the entire culture. And so let's just use a great example. It, it is in my personal opinion, and I think in the opinion of the natural law, evil and wrong to support the chemical castration of children Whoa. under the guise of gender-affirming care. Absolutely, absolutely. It's evil and wrong. A, a masculine energy would say, we're not putting up with this, it's not gonna happen. No, 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 but a feminine energy would say, but I wanna care for them. I wanna have compassion for them. I wanna have compassion too, you know how you have compassion? Not by chopping off their balls, okay? That's right. Or getting them Lupron. So look, Andrew Tate, controversial figure, but honestly, is Andrew Tate saying anything that 30 years ago would not have been commonplace to say? We are seeing the American man, porn addicted, lowest testosterone rates in 30 or 40 years, least married, least purpose, most suicidal in history. Why? It's because our society is configured towards collapsing the American man. That's bad for men, it's bad for women, it's bad for our country. And that's, I think, one of the reasons why Andrew Tate has become so unbelievably successful as he does it in an eloquent and charismatic way with a lot of wisdom. And if you wanted to conquer a country, you would have the men start becoming women and killing themselves. When you're looking at, uh, whew, that was, yeah, make, make some noise for that. Unbelievable. Um, when, when you're looking at, where, where men are today, you just got married a, a couple years now? Yeah. Okay. So for the singles that's here, how did you go about finding your wife, your spouse, your partner? Yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of marriage. Um, and if you're not married, I, I highly encourage it. So here's, and, and have as many kids as you possibly can, by the way, having kids is like the best thing ever. Um, look, if you know anything about my podcast or my public commentary, I tend to push back against like prevailing garbage in the media. I think hookup culture is so bad for society. I think that overindulging in these hookup apps is so terrible. I think pornography is destroying American men at such high levels. And again, I'm not moralizing in the sense, like I, I literally mean this, that if you're struggling with it, I totally get it. It's, these are predatory products. I'm just telling you, you can live a deeper life if you, if you don't engage in these things. Look, from a biblical standpoint, I think marriage is one of the most awesome things that God has given us. Amen. And I don't think we do a good enough job of celebrating marriage in our society. I, I don't think we lift it up as this beautiful ideal. And, <laughs> you know, I, I went to a college campus recently and they said, you know, I asked them a very simple question, what is a woman? They couldn't answer the question, obviously. Because they're so smart, they can't answer the most basic stuff. And 
you want to know what a woman is, marry one, you'll find out very quickly. Um, and this idea that men and women are exactly the same, only unmarried people could come up with an idea as stupid as that. <laughs> men and women are exactly the same. Right, get married for like a week. <laughs> and what you realize is in marriage, it is two polar opposite type of, not polar opposite, in some ways polar opposite, but opposite parts that come together in a union for a purpose. And it's not just the purpose of raising children, right? It's the purpose of fighting for the good, the true, and the beautiful, of supporting one another, of trying to honor the divine. And you don't get that just through a Tinder date. That's shallow. That, that's, just, that's just seeking an orgasm. Like, okay, anyone can do that. Here's a good rule for life. The hard things are the beautiful things. Things that require work are going to nourish your soul. A lot more than like, oh, I met this person at a Vegas bar. Be careful, by the way, with that. Um, and by the way, I'm not, if, you, if you did that last night, like, okay, you know, there's, God forgives. Um, whatever. So just ask for forgiveness and God will give it to you generously. I mean that, like, honestly, we're, we're all sinners. Um, what I'm trying to get at, though, is when you get married, you realize, like, wow, my life was completely empty before that. And there's a reason why the dress for the man is the same at a wedding and a funeral. You ever think about this? Because you're saying goodbye to your previous self. The woman is the, the icon, the symbol of beauty, almost always in all white, right? Ascendant. The man is usually in black and white, like he's attending somebody's death, because it is his death. No, but think about it. It's the death of the bachelor mindset. It's the death of promiscuity. It's the death of the wandering eye. It's the death of immoral behavior. It's the death of texting girls casually. It's the death of I get to do what I want to do. It's the death of just going to the bar with friends. It's the death of acting like an infant. It's the death of playing video games till 1 a.m. And it's the birth of a man. Boom! Hit a chord there, bro. Hit a chord there. Um, so, so you, br you brought up the Bible, so let's go down that road. You brought up the Bible, let's go down that road. Uh, I often look at Proverbs and Ecclesiastes as a way to model my life. I mean, same, King, same author, Solomon, right. King Solomon. Correct. And he was a son of? David. David, and he was hanging out with Bathsheba, and, and et cetera, et cetera. And Solomon did not finish well, but that's a... Correct. Right, because David had mighty men, Solomon had mighty women. Lots of them. Lots of them. So, um, but Proverbs 31 also is a great framework for women, for a woman of noble character. And so when I'm looking at my wife, like, wow, she checks off all the boxes. And, and I'm thinking about as a man and as a perspective, because the way I commit to my wife is the way I commit to my business. How you do one thing is how you do everything. And when you're looking at um, uh, the Bible in terms of finance and money, God and money, a lot of people are raised into thinking that, hey, Charlie, you've got a lot of money, it's a sin, you should just be content, relax, you shouldn't be so damn ambitious, God's going to provide. What would you say to Christian and believers out there that being rich is a sin? So first of all, I love the word, and if you're not in a relationship with Jesus Christ, I encourage you to do that. It'll change your life, Amen. and I want to see you guys in heaven. Amen. So, and if you're not convinced, and you're like, oh boy, I didn't come here to hear religion. Well, look, God loves you so much that he would even bring you to Las Vegas to hear about his son. <laughs> so. Rinsen City, baby. <laughs> I came here to do things that I will not do at home. Too bad you're hearing about Jesus Christ. You're getting it right here, okay? So, I love the word so much. 
The more you read the word, the more it reads you. It's this relationship. It's infinitely deep. The, harmoni the harmonizing of the scriptures. And I've been doing a deep study of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. But that's a, we could talk about that if you want. You're, you're, you're talking about it, two things. Number one is a misreading of Jesus' commandment around money. He says the love of money is the root of all evil. Okay? None of you should love money. You should not. Instead, you should understand money is a tool. It's a, it comes from a Greek word, techne, a technology. You can use it for good or you could use it for bad. Now, but what does Jesus say about multiplication? This is a much more important teaching. <coughs> the parable of the talents is one of the strongest lessons towards modern economy and entrepreneurs. If you're not familiar with the parable of the talents, Jesus, our Lord, is talking to his disciples about a scenario. A par he talked in parables, and it was a way that we could better understand, you know, what God wants to tell us. So, so Jesus says, look, there's three people, okay, and they're all given a certain distribution. And by the way, this is totally true. If I picked three random people, and I brought them up on stage, and I said, you get $5, you get $5, and you get $5, a day later, someone would have zero dollars, someone would have twenty dollars, and someone would have a hundred dollars. And in the parable of the talents, one of the people hides their money, right, under a rock. Another person modestly multiplies, and a, another person tremendously multiplies that money. For the person that hid their talent, now a talent can actually be applicable to your actual talents or money, right? So it actually in the story meant money. Who did nothing with it? who hid it under a rock, received condemnation in the parable. How dare you do nothing with what God has given you? Every single one of you, this is why I can't stand when people say, follow your heart, that's bad advice, don't do that, okay? I'm going to do what I love, don't do that. Do what you're good at. Every single one of you has a God-given skill. Every single one of you. So you might say, well, Charlie, I, I don't know what my skill is. What do people compliment you on? That is different. Maybe you're good at noticing, good at writing, good at speaking, good at organizing, good at empathizing, good at whatever it is. Find that skill that you don't truly hate and then pursue that, whatever it is. For me, my number one love would be college football. Like, okay, but yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> Got one college football fan, that's great. <laughs> um, but it's not the thing I'm best at. I enjoy what I do, and obviously I've learned to love it, but I'm, I'm good at speaking, I'm good at communicating, I'm good at writing, I'm good at doing these things. And so in the parable of the talents, Christ wants you to identify what God has given you and to take it and make more of it and to multiply it. And that is across the board, including financially. Now, I, I'm not gonna do the whole like prosperity gospel thing where God wants you to be rich and all this. I could tell you, God does not want you to be sitting still. That is a fact, and I'll prove it to you. All of us need to read Genesis 12 and the story of Abram. And that applies, especially to men, but it applies to women too. Get off your tail, leave your father's home, and go on an adventure. Genesis 12 is this incredible thing. So it's the city of Babel in Genesis. Sorry, I, I could go as deep as Rock, rocket. Genesis 11 is this cr crazy story, city of Babel. They want to build a one world government. God says not so fast, sound familiar. Anyway, so Genesis 12, you hear about this guy, Abram, living at his parents' home till his like 70s, like sitting around and God says, get up, go on an adventure. And boy, was it ever an adventure. God does not want you to be comfortable. He wants you, as it says in Joshua 1.9, be strong and courageous to go forth. Do you think Moses was thrilled when he was in Midian? He had a great life. Father-in-law likes him. That's not always the case. I Thankfully, it is for me, but when you get married, you'll realize that. Father-in-law likes him, right? Jethro, everything's great. And he's just going for a stroll. And that darn bush had to be on fire. And his life changed forever. In fact, it changed so much that in Numbers and Deuteronomy, Moses repeatedly says, God, why did you make me do this? These people won't stop complaining. These people are the worst. He's talking about the Hebrews. Like, you know, he's like, they're, they're, why? And God says, because I told you. And I am who I am. Tough luck. But he called them on an adventure that changed human history.
Time and time again, the heroes of the Bible are people that leave comfort and they go towards adversity. They leave what is easy and they go towards what is good. And that is a call for each and one of your lives. Come on. Come on. Speaking of uh, scripture, 1 Timothy 4.12 says, don't let anyone look down on you because you are young. But set an example for the believers in speech and conduct and love and faith and impurity. Charlie, you're 29 years old. I get up the top 10 questions I've been personally asked here down the hallway. Matt, how do I get to people because I'm young? How do I get people to believe me because I'm young? It didn't seem like you've had a problem with that. Yeah, so, so here's, my, here's my advice, especially if you, you hear that a lot. Every single one of you now, thanks to these literal supercomputers, for no charge, you can take learning very seriously. Every single one of you should do this. If you want to be an entrepreneur, you have to be a lifelong learner. You should be reading at least 50 books a year. You should be listening to fulfilling, soul-enriching content for two hours a day. And you should cut out all of the soul-depraving Netflix, Hulu, Amazon, all of that. If, so you only have so much time. You only have so much energy. So you have to choose not just what you eat physically, but are you going to consume junk food in television, junk food in radio, junk food in podcasting? You want to be taken seriously? Read 50 books over the next decade. That's 500 books, 50, book, 50 books a year for the next decade. That's 500 books on entrepreneurial, on American history, on finance, on economics. There, there's no lack of them, right? And they're all out there. By the way, most of them, they're like 20 bucks a pop, but if you want to, there's like free versions, there's YouTube lectures. There, there is no excuse for anybody in this room to not take learning seriously. So there's two ways, so let's talk about wisdom, right? Which Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, Proverbs about. is the book of wisdom. So Solomon, God comes on to Solomon, Solomon, what do you want? He says, I want wisdom. And so what is wisdom? Wisdom is the knowledge of things that don't change. Wisdom is the knowledge of eternal truths. Wisdom are things that will be just as true 100 years from now as they were 200 years prior. Knowledge can change, right? Knowledge is facts and figures, who's the governor of this, center of that, that's important. But wisdom is answering much more important questions. What is good? What is evil? What is our relationship with God? Why are we here? What is my purpose? Where am I going after I die? What is love? What is mercy? What is, ju what is justice? What is prudence? What is temperance? Hmm. Where do the best people live? Who are the worst people live? What are the best form of governments? These are things that matter a lot more than facts and figures that you could recite quickly just to take a test. Every single one of you has in front of you an ability to obtain wisdom. So there's two ways to get wisdom. One is through a lot of life experience, multi-decades of suffering, and you might get some wisdom. Or you can pursue texts, authors, and writers that have presented these things, the Bible being one of them. But there is an unlimited canon in the Western tradition that is accessible to each and every one of you. That you're like, wow, I never thought of that before. And where does wisdom truly begin? Wisdom begins with the fear of the Lord. Understanding that there is a God and you are not him. <laughs> Those two truths. And if I may just say one other thing on this, why are college campuses some of the most idiotic environments on the planet? because they don't honor God, and without God, there is no wisdom. Yeah. These are godless institutions huh. where they are constantly scrapping and searching for answers when it's accessible to each and every one of us. So if you want to be taken seriously as a young person, listen more than you speak, read more than you project. So delete your social media apps on your phone, and instead, dive deep into the great ideas. You might say, Charlie, how do I do this? So I've partnered with Hillsdale College, free resource, charlie4hillsdale.com. It's charlie4hillsdale.com. 35 online courses. They'll enrich your life significantly from the Bible to Aristotle to American history. If you are a lifelong learner, you will be successful and you will be an accomplished entrepreneur. That's awesome. I think there's some people here that went to Hillsdale College too as well. So uh, Greg and Beth Smith, I think, when they went to Hillsdale College over here. Um, when, when you're looking at... Children, you're around Trump a lot. You know, we talk about accessibility. You know, you just did an event in Florida a few weeks ago where the top conservative candidates, presidential candidates were on stage, rocking the stage. And, and you, you were going on PBD podcast talking about, yeah, I text DeSantis and camp, but it takes me a minute. But I call Trump and he picks up. When you are around his family, around his kids, how, from your observation, how has he raised his kids to 
integrate and, and, and see them as part of his li personal life and business life. Uh, can I just like riff on Trump just for, just okay. for a second? Yeah. So look, I, I'm sure you guys all have mixed opinions of him. I, I honestly have heard it all. I really don't care. So I mean, I, I'm not here to convince you otherwise. I'm just going to convince you one thing, okay? That you might hate the man, you might love the man, you might think he's terrible, you might want him in prison or whatever. If you want to be an entrepreneur, listen very, a successful one, listen very carefully to what I'm telling you, okay? You will experience adversity in life. It's a guarantee. There'll be times where you get sued, you get lied about, you get leaked on by a former employee. All these things are a guarantee of being an entrepreneur. And we hear about on the media every single negative of Donald Trump. Narcissist, egotist, whatever. Do we ever hear about the virtues of Donald Trump? Ever. Let me tell you one. I pray that you guys are a fraction as tough as he is when the whole world comes collapsing down around you or around him. And you might say, oh, Charlie, that doesn't convince me. If you were facing 600 years in federal prison, literally like 100 different lawsuits, everybody coming against you, I don't know if I'd have the fortitude to keep on going. But I just want you to look at him in a different way the next couple of weeks and say, boy, he has every reason to give up. Every single reason to say no more because you will be in a place in life in the next decade or two where it feels like the walls are closing in, where everything is collapsing. And I want you to look and say, you know what, despite all the negatives I hear about him, I think it is darn admirable that this guy keeps on fighting and he keeps on scrapping and he will not give up. So, wow. yes, as far as, as, far as um, his kids, he's raised great kids. Look, I, I, I'm biased. President Trump has been a great friend. We've gotten to know each other really well. He treated me super well. I'm awfully defensive of him in the sense of just like, I don't think people really understand who he is. He's an alpha beast entrepreneur that loves his country, that is the bodyguard of Western civilization. He's like New York City entrepreneur, developer, meets UFC fighter, you know, meets just like, I want to see the country in a better place. And I, 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 I really am, I'm saddened by where we're at in the country, regardless of your politics, I, I really, I, it doesn't really bother me. I think we can all agree that it's just flat out wrong that you can use the instruments of government to go indict a, like honestly, if you hate Trump so much, go beat him at the ballot box. Like stop indicting him, okay? You are, you are cutting in line to try to interrupt a direct referendum of whether or not you want this person to be an elective office or not. And so the, the other thing I'll say about this, I've never seen a human being work as hard as Donald Trump. I just had, I had dinner with him a couple weeks ago in Bedminster, New Jersey. And like, I'm a pretty high energy guy and he exhausts me, like exhausts me. Like after two hours of a dinner with him, I'm like, I gotta go to bed. He's like, and how about this and this guy and this, and have you seen this thing? And like, and this, and get me, he's like, oh my goodness. And he's 77. He's 77. And I think he's like Benjamin Button. I think he's getting younger. It's like unbelievable. <laughs> I see him, he's like, he's looking fitter and better. And in some ways, like all this opposition is like a life force to him. And I'll kind of just repeat what I said in a different way though, which is, you know, it, um, it's easy to complain. It's easy to give up. It's easy to do all those things. But you are go there's going to be a question where there's a fork in the road. Do I surrender or do I persevere? Do I surrender or do I persevere? And um, I, I've learned the lesson firsthand from him that whenever I come against opposition, that I'm gonna keep on pushing through. Amen, amen. We have debates on stage internally. We have debates, okay? So you're a great debater. Any points that you give to somebody, regardless if you're debating on stage here for this conference or debating out when we're running our businesses and debating with folks uh, art in our communities and we have made, have some future politicians and some policymakers here, or we give birth to future governors and presidents are right out of this. Honestly, of this don't become a politician, get super rich and then donate to politicians. It's way nicer. Okay. <laughs> so please, it's like, it, we, we have enough politicians. We need more entrepreneurs, value creators. Um, debating, three things. Know your audience. Are you trying to win over an external audience or are you trying to win over the person you're debating? That's not the same thing, right? So if you're debating in a classroom, if you're debating on an online forum, you might be trying to win over somebody else, not the actual person you're debating. Number two, it's not some sort of, you know, crazy thing, but just ask questions. Instead of telling people what you believe, say, oh, where, where has that ever worked before? 
Or, that's interesting, have you ever considered it from this way? Ask questions. Number three, know your material. There is no replacement to understanding the knowledge of whatever you're debating. And so, you know, it, it motivated me to not go to college because I was tired of people telling me that I was stupid and dumb. I was like, okay, I'm going to read more than you, I'm gonna study more than you, and I take learning just as seriously as anything else I do. Just as seriously as some of you guys go to the gym, as seriously as you guys, you know, whatever it is that you take seriously, people say, Charlie, what's your hobby? Like, honestly, my hobby is reading and turning my phone off and learning. I love learning. And, but all sorts of different types of topics, geopolitics, economics, history, philosophy. And there, there, just, there's so much out there that can sharpen you for a very, very adversarial word, world. And honestly, I think it's fun. I think it's fun to learn. I think that if you have a passion for a topic, becoming a master of it, um, I, I find great delight and comfort in that. Charlie, we've got the last couple of minutes here. I'm going to give you the final word here. What do you want us to take away from this conversation for us to save America? What's going on today? I know you mentioned entrepreneurship. You mentioned a lot of different things. What would you like to have us take away? Yeah, th thank you for that. Um, I'm going to do a shameless plug. If you guys want to subscribe to my podcast, you can. I think you guys might like it. Um, we're constantly, uh, we do three podcasts a day. It's the Charlie Kirk Show. And uh, if you agree with some of the stuff we're talking about or even disagree, we're never boring. That's my guarantee. Charlie Kirk Show, never boring. Um, and so you guys can, can check that out. A couple things, please, my encouragement for you is break out of the media matrix of the mindset that they have in you. We live in a beautiful country. There's so much opportunity in front of you. You are the master of your own destiny and that you can chart a course that is better for yourself and for your kids and for your grandkids. You live in the envy of the world. So you have a choice. You can, and if I were to divide the country again, there's two other groups of people. There are the grateful and the ungrateful. The mark of the happiest and the most joyful people on the planet are people that make the conscious decision and attitude to engage in gratitude. Gratitude is the fruit that makes all other things taste sweet. Ingratitude is the gateway drug towards resentment, towards bitterness, and towards envy. And every single day, if you go through the conscious decision of, I am going to say, I am thankful to God or whoever you wanna be thankful to for my circumstance, for life, for breath, that I get a chance to be on this planet, as it says in Esther, for such a time as this, your entire mindset will shift. We could go all day long, and I don't mean this in a joking way, and we could bring up 100 random people in this arena, and we would hear story after story of difficulty, of parents that died unexpectedly, of kids that are dealing with health challenges. All of that is legitimate. But is that what we are going to assume as our permanent place of dwelling? Instead, if you say, I am grateful that I live in this nation, I'm grateful that I have a chance to be able to take risks, I'm grateful that I get to be an entrepreneur, everything starts to change. And you look at these things as opportunities, not as obstacles, you will break through in a place, and honestly, you will no longer be part of the generation that is the most suicidal, alcohol-addicted, drug-addicted, porn-addicted generation in history. And it's just as simple as a mindset shift. And let me just kind of close with this, because you did open the door previously. The most important way that you will be thankful, though, is realize that there's a God who created you, and he loved you so much that he sent his son on a rescue mission to save you. And there's nothing you do for it. You don't earn it, you accept it. It is a free gift right in front of you. The gospel in four words is Jesus took my place. Three words, him for me. Two words, substitutionary atonement. One word, grace. Every single person in this room will have to meet our creator. I am thankful beyond any words, that when I have to go hold account for all of my treachery, my deceit, my lying, my self-righteousness, I have a bailout card. So I'll be able to say, I gave my life to your son, Jesus Christ, and for that, I will be bailed out for all my sins. God bless you guys, and thank you so much for having me. Everybody, turn the curtain. Thank you so much, I appreciate you. Uh, no, I can't believe it. I got you. Gotcha. It was. 
Gotcha. So on behalf of PHP NC, we got you from one great leader, Missouri's great gifts. And this is an Abraham Lincoln wow. coin and currency collection on behalf of PHP NC. Our associates here, we thank you, Charlie Kerr, for grace and your presence here at Saving America Conference. Thank Thanks. you much. Thank you. All right. Hey, with Charlie. Charlie, what was your time wow. here? Wow, what, what a group. Tons of energy. Uh, I, I just love PHP. You guys are always so good to me. And uh, you let me share the gospel, which is, which is the coolest thing. So, Appreciate you, Charlie. God bless you.